Hello and welcome. This is Lisa Jones, and you are listening to the Exploring Death Podcast. Hello, it's Lisa Jones with Exploring Death, and today I have with me Lee Harris. He is the author of Energy Speaks. He is also an intuitive medium, transformational leader, musician, and visual artist. In 2004, he began holding channeling sessions and readings in his home, and today he leads workshops throughout the world, and his videos reach hundreds and thousands every month. A native of England, he is now based in California. You can visit him online at leeharrisenergy.com. Hi, Lee. Hi. Great to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you on this podcast, and I was just explaining that I've recently received your brand new book, Energy Speaks, and I love the subtitle, Messages from Spirit on Living, Loving, and Awakening, and you cover so many topics in your book, and I know there's, I've got so many questions, but I, it just was recently published, so tell me how it's going, kind of where, where you're at with this whole thing. It's great, actually. It's it's lovely. About a week before the book came out, I was a little bit nervous uh, <laughs> and went a little. Bit, oh. um, but you know, we've worked on this book for over two years um, because the way that traditional publishing works, there's always almost a year delay from final manuscript to release. So what has been lovely is just how people have responded to it. Because um, even though we worked on the book for for two for two years, it's actually over a decade in the making. Um, these messages have come through that we have transcribed and edited and laid out for the book, um, some of them as long as 10 years ago. So I'm really loving, I feel like there's something interesting going on around collapsing time in my life right now, watching people respond in this moment to things that perhaps were coming through years ago, but have now been presented for 2019 and beyond. Wow. I love that because I do agree that I feel like energy or time has been shifting so much recently because I mean, I got into this about 15 years ago when I had my out of body experience and, and, and back then it was just so less, uh, I don't know, talked about or just out there. And yet the messages that I've been receiving for the last 15 years are so universal and so important and even feels more so now. <laughs> which I don't quite understand that. But like you said, it's like collapsing energy or collapsing time. It's so true. And it's funny, you know, I, I, and this is kind of a good reminder for any of us who create anything that other people's opinions are just other people's opinions. And you do have to follow your own path because I had, I had someone who was working with me almost, I mean, this is probably about 2010 and we talked about publishing some of the channeled material. And I remember this person saying at the time, oh, it's really old. It's old information now. It's no longer cutting edge, so you shouldn't bother. And, you know, it wasn't my main focus at the time. So I kind of just, but I always remember the comment and I thought how interesting that we've put the book out now and many of these topics are really timeless um, and yet interesting that if you'd have said to me 15 years ago when I began doing readings for people, you will have a book in 15 years and this is what it will look like and this is how people will be responding to it. I wouldn't have been able to put that together because the world was so different and this topic was still very niche back then in a way that it no longer is today, which is fantastic. Wow. I love that. And I also think it's really interesting because 2004, is that when this all yes. kind of started for you? That was the year I had my out-of-body experience. So I love that we kind of are in sync. And not only that, but I want you to talk about your the Zs because one of my guides that came through to me, uh, which I've never shared actually publicly, when I did my automatic handwriting, I asked who they were and one of them identified themselves as Bertra, the other as Zeta. And uh, so I loved when I read about your Z's, I said, oh, I have a Z too. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's, let's step back and, and you can tell people how, how this unfolded for you, how this whole, the, you know, your story. Yeah. So, you know, my story is um, like many of us that I was a very sensitive kid, but um, in my case, and again, this isn't an atypical story at all. I, I didn't know how to handle that and I didn't know what it was. So I turned it on myself. So I became a destructive eater. 
Um, so from a very young age, actually, I was taken to Weight Watchers age 10. And then I was going to diet clinics all through my teens because I would compulsively eat. Um, and of course, what I was trying to do was feel okay, because I didn't. Um, but, but my breakthrough came around my late teens. I was about 16, 17 when I started to lose at the time, what ended up being 60 pounds and I was smaller and, you know, I wasn't the same frame I am now, but I started to find my creative expression and I started to begin the healing path. And I got really into metaphysics, really into self growth. I was taken to see a channeler. Um, about, uh, it was about a year before it happened to me. But even though I loved metaphysics and readings and I was a believer, I remember coming away from the channeler being skeptical um, because I remember really liking him as a man and he was clearly, you know, talented. But I remember coming away and thinking, why did he close his eyes and change his voice? Why did he have to do that? He could have just, because I didn't get it. I didn't, I, you know, I, I couldn't quite process what it was. And of course the egg is now on my face because I completely understand now when you're channeling your guides, you're letting them come through you. So it is a different mind. It's a different language. It's a different vibration to the way you see the world yourself. And so that's how it happened for me. I was on the underground train going to work. So the tube, as we call it in London, where I was living back then, I was 23. And um, I was sifting through thoughts in my head that morning, all the things that I thought were wrong with my life. And I suddenly heard this voice from the left say, that's an interesting theory, but you're wrong. And I was like, huh? You know, I'd never had this before. So that began a back and forth dialogue. And um, they explained, we're your guides. Um, you can call me Zachary. Um, I'm the lead spokesperson. And um, that was really the beginning of a five-year journey for me of asking questions, receiving answers, writing it down, studying it, and seeing the positive effect on my life. Then I began helping friends, and one of those friends said, you should do this for other people. So um, I started readings 15 years ago, and I uh, didn't think anyone would come, and the rest is history. Wow. I, I love it. And it's so similar to my story as well in that I went to an angel reader, and something opened up when she brought through her channel. And I left there with a book on angel, it was called Angel Speak, how to connect with your angels. And it, it talked about automatic handwriting. And so I started doing that. And I didn't tell anyone. I thought, I, you know, I thought this whole thing was crazy. I mean, being a former certified public accountant and a very, you know, linear in, in my thinking and, um, and even the whole angel thing was out of my realm. So, <laughs> but I, so I started doing it for myself. And then when I started opening up a little bit more and slowly telling some friends, they would ask me to, to, ask the angels. And, um, and I'll, I remember the very first time somebody asked me, and I, I'm curious about you for you as well. When they asked me a question, I said, well, let me get a pad of paper. And they're like, well, can't you just speak it rather than write it down? And oh my goodness, I thought a train, the energy came through so hard and fast because I knew nothing about preparing myself or grounding myself or any of those things. And um, my teeth started chattering and it came out very robotic and it scared me because I, I didn't understand this other vibration coming through my body. And the whole idea of closing your eyes and shifting, like I shift my, my, myself out of the way, right, to be able to bring it through. So I'm just curious what your experience was the first time you actually channeled using your voice. Yeah, you know, I the first time I think I, I I don't remember that much about the first time using my voice, but I I do remember um, immediately noticing the things that would happen. So, for example, the first public channel I did that was for more than just one person, it was probably forty five minutes long, and I remember being very hot at the end and feeling like um, so my body temperature went up. And I felt very euphoric afterwards as if I had been, it was kind of like getting a spiritual colonic, you know, everything in your body had been cleansed. And still to this day, that's how I can feel after channeling. Um, but what you describe, I, I see this a lot and I, I noticed it for myself. I always used to, my neck and my shoulders, there would be a lot of kind of um, 
this for anyone who's listening and not watching video. I'm, you know, my, my, my head would turn to the left and to the right a lot at the beginning and it would all focus around my shoulders. That's calmed down now and so has, I think, any vocal changes. But at the beginning, it's quite normal that physical, uh, physical, ch physical shifts and the body not being very settled with it and the same with your voice. I feel like there comes a certain point when you calibrate and it just lands more, you're more used to grounding it in your body. So it's a little less um, theatrical or uh, demonstrative, shall we say. Right, right. I, that is so fascinating because I've never really spoken to anybody about the idea of, as you mentioned, the theatrics or like you walked away from that channel going, why did he have to change his voice? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, but it's not something that you're purposely doing for anyone listening that's not a channel. <laughs> It's something that just happens to your body. And, yeah. and I've always explained it as vibrationally, it's just a different energy coming through. I mean, we're literally a channel, you know, this other energy, it's like tuning into a radio, right? And a different mm -hmm. voice is coming through, a different channel is coming through and speaking and using our body as their conduit. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, so fascinating. So... So you did, um, I'm just curious how your progression went. You were doing this for yourself and then for your friends, and then you just started holding little groups and, and tell me where it went from there. Yeah. So, you know, I did, I did readings for, um, oh, I did a lot of people. I think the first 60 days I had 60 readings and, um, and I was, it took me almost two years to move from doing it part-time to full-time, but not unlike you, you know, I didn't tell my family I was doing this um, until it became awkward. Um, you know, why, why is Lee running off uh, with his laptop <laughs> all the time to kind of, you know, and saying, Oh, I'll be back in two hours, you know? Um, so, so yeah, because I think there is, I, I think they're ingrained in our culture. There is a stigma. And there is a fear of the unknown. And there is a, a lot of nonsense out there about what spirit is. Um, and I think the problem is because we've all been taught to be so separate from it. And even our, you know, much of our religious, uh, religious organizations keep people away from connecting to God or connecting to a higher power themselves. It's like you go through the priest, you go through the structure. Um, and it's not that long ago that people were being burned as witches. Um, I think all of those things collide to create this <gasps> in people, including in ourselves. And so um, I kept it very quiet, um, but I had this thriving reading business going on the side. Um, and I had a partner at the time. Uh, we were together for a few years and we would work together. Um, he was also a channeler. Um, so we started doing public work together. Um, and then we went our separate ways in, in life and in work. And from there, it just really grew. Um, but for me, what happened was I went from just solely channeling for people to becoming more of an energy intuitive. I already was an intuitive person, but it just went through the roof the more I channeled. So I started to position myself not just as a channeler, but also as someone who could help people who perhaps were very oriented around channeling higher vibrations, but didn't know how to connect it with where they were as a human being. And, and, you know, that was the path I was living. I was like, how do I take this channeled information and make it fit to some of the areas that I can tell I'm limited in my human life or I'm scarred or I'm, I don't know enough. And, and so for me using channeling as a path of and a complement to self self growth became really where I mostly did my work. Fascinating. And I would love it. Do you have a couple of stories about how you were able to use that channeled information and then maybe make a shift, whether it was in your life or maybe one of your clients that really helped them? Yeah. Well, you know, I would say with clients, it would be very much the case of, um, the channeled information could come to me about what was going on for them. But for me, it was paying attention to how they reacted. So for example, you know, let's say you're my client, Lisa, and I say to you, um, we'll choose a comedy one because you are the millionaire medium. I say <laughs> to you, um, oh, Lisa, you're going to be very abundant in your future financially. That's something they're asking me to tell you. I then watch the way it hits you and you're like, because all your fear comes up or all your limit or your family history of, oh, we've got no money. 
So what starts to rise in your body is the block to that becoming part of your reality, the old programming, the old story. So as I would see and sense that with people, I would talk to them where they were. I'd go, okay, what just hit you? And we'd, we, would, we would work it together. We would get underneath it. We would open it out. We'd shine a flashlight so that they weren't just living off predicted information. They were seeing how the information from the channel was hitting them right now in the present. Because to me, that's the growth. The prediction is irrelevant. It's um, if those kinds of predictions come in for us, if we can access some part of the future, that means our now can start to become that future right now. But most of us have a kind of growth reaction when that happens. You know, I don't know many people who don't grow and go through some growing pains. So for me, working with people on those growing pains was something I got really passionate about doing and serving um, because that was what I needed um, in my own life too. So to be able to give that back while I was also doing that in my own life for myself was great. I really appreciate that idea because I think sometimes there's a, I'll just say frustration on my part when I work with clients and channel information. And it's almost like them walking up to a buffet and just like, you know, taking what they want and, and just walking away, but the, it doesn't really feed them or they don't take the information and use it to then change their life. It's almost just yes. like they walk up or maybe not a buffet is a good example, but maybe just, Oh, they're walking up to watch this movie and they just stare at it for a while, but then they walk away and don't take the information that's given and really use it to their advantage. So I love the idea of looking at that, how it hits them and then using that as the, the kind of the device or the, the feedback as to then how they can shift their life to make a, a change. Well, it's, it's, it's great that you're bringing this up because it's kind of the, the kind of addictive personality that we all can have. Um, it's like, oh, I want the tarot reader to tell me that my future is going to be great because my present feels like, you know, crap. And I feel awful about it. But if I go and sit there and hear that three to six months, I'm going to feel better. I will have relief for anything from three hours to three days. But of course, it's no different to what I was doing as a kid. I was feeling all my pain. So I would eat five Snickers bars in 10 minutes. And for about 10, 20 minutes, felt like I was having some sugar high and felt like I'd solved the pain. And then of course, 30 minutes later, um, it wouldn't be hitting my body very well. I would start to crash and the cycle just continues. So I think the, the, the risk or the problem sometimes with spiritual pursuit or um, the pursuit of metaphysics or predictions can be, we just want to put the band-aid on the now. Whereas that wasn't really how I was ever wired around self-growth and personal development work. I was like, okay, I know this is going to be uncomfortable. I know that results come through pushing into my fear or my comfort zone. Um, so therefore, that's kind of how I always approached my sessions. After about the first three years, I decided I was no longer going to be the channeling ATM for people. And I stopped just channeling in my sessions and I would do some channeling, but I started working with them kind of in the middle place because it was more satisfying for me to see that we were actually helping that person help themselves rather than me throwing a bunch of sugar at them that might have temporarily fed them. I love that so much. And I don't think that's talked about enough in this whole realm of spirituality and that pursuit of, um, getting the, the high, the fix, the, as you said, the ATM. And that's, I think, partly why I've stepped back a bit is that I don't want to be that ATM for people. It doesn't feel good to me. And, and I, I think it does feel good to them, but, but I don't want to feed that, that addiction as you, as you coined it. I mean, now I'm working with people longer term, you know, it's got to be three to six months because I want to see transformation, not just, not just a, a quick hit of dopamine for lack of a, you know, a better word. I mean, that's really what they're getting when they come to, to do that reading. And, and then they walk away feeling good, like you said, for a day to three days, and then it just wears off and they're back to their same old, same old. So I really appreciate that you can, that you well, can see that. I love that you're bringing it up because I think especially, so in your case, for example, calling yourself a medium, 
um, mediums, psychics, they have a bit more of a history on the planet and people have an idea of what they are, which is currently changing because our whole world is changing around transformation and personal growth. You know, we're becoming a much more personal growth oriented culture. It's becoming much more part of the mainstream, but that's very recent. So I think the old view of medium, oh, I'm going to sit there and they're going to tell me what my dead relative, and then I go home and there's no real, um, the relationship is very fixed and very old. So, you know, one of the things I, I advise, because I've worked with lots of people, um, I stopped doing private sessions and mentoring last year, but I've worked with lots of people on their work in the world. And I would always say, have on your booking page, the first line should be to deter people that you know you shouldn't be working with. So for example, this is not just prediction. So if that's what you're looking for, I'm not the right medium for you. My work is about transformation. And while some predictions will be part of it, predictions can change and predictions, you know, so you, you just lay it all out. And, um, and I think that's the tricky thing about doing this work is I think, especially when you first start, so not you, but somebody else, when you first start, I think you can feel a little bit beholden to being the thing that you're saying you're being and their expectation of who you should be or what they expect. And then I think the more you do it, the more you go, no, this is how I do it. And that's okay. And that's enough. Right. And I, and I love that you mentioned the, just the word psychic, the word medium, the word channel. There's so much baggage around each one of those words. And that's, I think also where I've struggled with Yes, I call myself a medium, but I, I like to have a broader definition in that. I am a medium. I stand between the earth and the divine and, you know, I'm in between. So it's not just dead relatives because, I mean, so much more comes through. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, marketing-wise, millionaire medium, it sounds good. It's that alliteration. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, not to mention the, the way I was, if people don't know, millionaire medium, the night my husband died, I became a millionaire and he started talking to me from the other side. So that's mm. the medium part of it. But again, there's mm. a much broader experience going on here than just those two words. So um, it is interesting how to me in our society, how just words, you know, people just, it's all the connotations around the words that people get hung up on and, um, and well, or expectations, right? Yeah. And I, I know what I love about this topic of conversation, because I think everybody listening or watching this will relate to this. Even if you aren't a working medium or channeler or intuitive, whenever you say to somebody that you're with, either that you are a medium or you're a channeler or you work in spirituality, or if you don't work in any of those areas, you just say, oh, I really like spirituality. It's that moment where their eyes glaze over and they're no longer with you. They're now with their idea about spirituality, channeling mediumship, and they change. And I think I used to notice that so acutely that I would stop telling people what I did because I didn't like being at a party with someone and having a really nice connection with them. And then all of a sudden you insert what you do because they ask you and they change toward you because suddenly they're, they're in their own relationship with that thing and they're no longer truly with you. So I bet everybody listening will have had that moment in their life when they talk to someone they're close to about their spiritual beliefs. And, and I think that's always, it's great when you notice that's happening because then you don't take it personally. You're like, oh, okay. I just went into their box of what this is. And then you can just hold a bit more space around it for, for you and for them. Right. Oh my gosh. And it's so true. Even when I published my book in 2013, I did not want the word spiritual on the cover because it freaked me out. I was still <laughs> freaked out by the word spiritual. And, and um, it's, just, it's just so interesting how, it's just how things unfold and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, where, where you've been, where we're going, where, I mean, it's just fascinating how, how things change and, and your mm -hmm. own perceptions and... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So true. I'm curious, are, do you have any just amazing synchronistic stories that things that just have happened in your life that you, it's probably happening all the time, but just any, I, I just love synchronicity stories just to help people understand that first of all, this happens to everybody, but I, so I just love having the awareness around it because I think it, when other people hear other stories, it helps them start seeing it more in their life. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's so funny because you're right. It happens all the time to me now. So I, I actually see it as completely normal. So I have to try and think. Um, but it, but it's true. I remember going back and when they first used to happen, it's like when you meet someone and they just happen to be friends with your sister who lives a million states. It's like, how did that happen? And it's like, there is no, you know, we are all so connected. So for me, it's when our connection to our destiny path keeps showing itself. I'll give you an example. Just moved into this office and studio space. And um, I went to... Um, put my name down on a wait list for an office over the road when it suddenly hit me on December the 21st, I need an office space. I, I have an office at home, but I felt like I needed a, a bigger space, something outside the house. And um, yeah, I couldn't get in on this place. And I was like, oh, this could be really good. I like the coffee shop underneath. I like the area. But no, nope, they, they were full. And as I'm driving away, I see my eye catches a sign I have never seen before on the building over the road that I'm in now. And it says uh, space for lease. So I call the number. I make an appointment. Uh, this very office that I'm standing in, I'm walking through to see another building just that side of the wall. And it felt really wrong. But I was in this space and I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if, if this was one room? Because they've just separated a very big space into multiple spaces. But I was like, oh, well, not meant to be. I go home and I get a call from the guy who, had, who the, the guy, the lease agent said, oh, I'm sorry, you saw the wrong place. Where you were standing, that's actually going to be separated into a room. You can go back and see it tomorrow. I'll tell you where the key is. So I came back and I met the landlady and she said, I never meet my tenants. She said, it's just random that I'm here. We really clicked. I managed to make it exactly what I needed. They were so helpful. And that, that, that's like a very recent experience of this being meant to be. It's five minutes from our house and there aren't many commercial buildings where we live because we're in a fairly quiet area. So, you know, I'm sat here in this place that I feel like has been on the map for me for three years, but I didn't see it until the day that I was ready to see it and it was all ready to connect. But there've been lots of synchronicities about this space manifesting. Wow. I love it. And I love it that, like you said, it's been there. It's, and it's been there all the time for three years and you just yep. never had seen it before. And, and my whole body is chilling right now because that's, that's life. Everything that we really want is right in front of us, but we can't see it because it's not either time or we're just not in the moment of when it's supposed to be revealed to us or <laughs> who knows why, but <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But when the time is right, um, uh, I mean, and I'll just share a quick synchronicity story. I was in a workshop this weekend and two of the uh, gals that were in it, one had flown over here from the San Francisco area and she was chatting with one of the other ladies that lives here on Maui. And it turns out the woman from San Francisco, her son and the other woman's grandson were at the same event in San Francisco together at the same weekend. Wow. So, I mean, again, what are the chances that... <laughs> just randomly these two ladies and the fact that they even chatted you know i mean there were 20 people in the event but just that they even stumbled upon that conversation to be able to discover that their beloveds you know a son and a grandson were together and they were both looking at the same sleepaway camp for the you know coming up the summer and everything so that's fantastic it's just amazing i mean truly and that's what i love is when you start really embracing these synchronicities and um, just allowing things to unfold, it just unfolds and unfolds and unfolds. You know, like you said, yeah. it's everywhere all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also uh, when we push against it or when we don't surrender to things, that's a great teaching moment too. Like I'm, I, I've got pretty good at this now, but I'll still have my moments where I'll think something has gotten in the way of what I wanted to do next or what I thought right. the business needed next or, uh-oh, this broadcast we were supposed to do, here's a big problem. And of course, it's never a big problem. It's that I'm meant to go to the electronics store because something's going to happen on the drive or the person I'm going to meet. So I'm I'm constantly reminded that lesson too. I think that synchronicity and us feeling and seeing those moments it's just as powerful when we want to fight the tide and that we catch ourselves not trusting and going, no, it's, it's all going to work out. It's, it's whatever happens, there is going to be something about what happens that, that we ultimately have to trust. Absolutely. And oh my goodness, that is such a great, I think, nugget 
for people listening to just take away because when things don't work, that's also synchronistic mm -hmm. because it didn't work because precisely for the reason that it needed to not work in order for you to end up ultimately where you end up being. I remember recently I was going to a baby shower and for whatever reason, I could not get out of my house. Like just something kept calling me to, you know, do something over there and do something. And so ultimately I was almost an hour late to the baby shower, which again, it didn't matter. It was an open house. So it, but in my mind, I felt like I had to be there. Well, when I left my home, there was a huge traffic accident that had happened within that hour time that I would have uh -huh. been going. And so mm -hmm. to me, when things don't work out, you just say, okay, so I guess, yeah. you know, what's next? <laughs> Instead yeah. of fighting against like, oh, you know, I'm just going to, even though I feel like I shouldn't leave right now, I'm going to go anyway. Like, you know, wow, just go with the flow and, and, and just when things don't work out, embrace that rather than be upset about it. Yeah. Cause, cause what I, what I know to be true is how we respond to what's happening is more important than what we make happen. So it's yes. not to say that what we make happen isn't important because a lot of the times we're, we're creating from alignment and things are happening and that's great. But, but actually how we react and respond to everything is, is so is the experience of being human um, as much as if not sometimes more than building things, making things happen, making right. connections happen. And yet we're not um, trained that way as kids. Um, you know, we, we grew up in our very linear achievement results oriented society and we don't have enough time spent on the other side of life, which is just awareness and presence. So right. most of us yeah. bang our heads against that as, as we go, you know? Absolutely. Well, I would love to pull a few cards for you if you're open for that. Great. Yes. We'll see what kind of synchronicities come up with that. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Let me do a little shuffle. And I always pull three cards. Okay. <clears throat> Ooh, I love it. I feel like it's kind of a, it's kind of along the theme of what we've been talking about. So the first card is the blockage card, which is acceptance. And I think um, as we were talking, you know, it's all about just accepting what is. And so much, so many of us, including myself, I'm, I know I don't want to accept that. I don't want to accept the fact that I, you know, I wanted to be at that baby shower at a certain time. You know, I, it's like you push against it or, um, you know, just, just, even you having this opening up of the channeling and stuff, you know, at first it's uncomfortable and I don't want to accept it, but you know, you just allow it, allow it to come. And so the action is flow. And, and that's the action step is to just be in the flow of life, be allow things to unfold as they're, as they're unfolding. And, um, and then I love it. The outcome is beginnings, you know, new beginnings happen that way. So many people I think are so determined of how things are going to be and how they're supposed to turn out that they just don't let the magic and the majesty unfold, which in so many ways can be so much better. And I want to say not in so many ways, but in every way is so much yeah. better than we can imagine. So have you, <laughs> does that resonate? Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny, even it's funny you mentioned the book because uh, a good friend of mine is Scott Stabile, who is a wonderful person, writer, author, and he and I spoke about a week before the book came out. And um, he said, how are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm having some really rough days. I mean, I was also in the middle of like constructing this office. So this was an upgrade. The book was about to come out and I was just processing stuff, um, which was, I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was just going, okay, I'm guessing this is growing pains. And he said to me, um, he said, oh yeah, he said, well, the week my book came out, I kind of went a bit crazy. He said, and my book wasn't channeled. And when you and I first met three years ago, you told me you were moving away from channeling. And it just hit me. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, because you're so often just doing what you're doing. And, and for me, the book felt important to, to do. So I just did it. But um, so there has been something to me about surrendering to and accepting this book, because the first book I was going to do for this publisher was actually a book in my own voice. So um, 
it's been interesting fielding questions about it because suddenly I'm the channeler. And um, so there has been a lot of acceptance and surrender and it's been really good. It's been really good for me to go, oh, okay, well, we just put a flag in the ground and now the rest of my world is reorganizing itself because I put the flag in the ground. So I do relate to, to those cards a lot and it's great. Wow. And that is, that's fantastic because I, I, I can see how that would happen. Like you, you know, oh no, I'm moving away from that. But then the book just brings you right back and then mm -hmm. new beginnings, right? It's a new mm -hmm. start. It's a new place to be. And, um, and, and it's fascinating. And I would just, I want to, ir ir what's the word? I forgetting the word. Anyway, I just want to recommend the book energy speaks. I, like I said, I have received it and there's so much good information in here and I would love to talk to you. Um, kind of as we're winding up, but I, this three week self love challenge, because that's something I've been working on really loving myself. And it's funny because I've always thought I loved myself and, mm -hmm. and I think I do, but, um, but when it really gets down to it, I find myself not wanting to spend time alone with myself, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm always looking, <laughs> Oh, who can I call and talk to, or who can I do other things with? And, and not that that's necessarily that I don't love myself, but this spending time alone. So can you just talk to us, the listeners about this idea of the three week self love? Challenge? Yeah. Um, so the three week self love challenge, this was something that was given. So in 2010, I did a weekend on self love in Berlin. Um, it was a workshop. It was a lot of channeling and some process work with the participants. And this challenge was given there. And then what if for three weeks, every single day, you did something loving towards yourself consciously. So sure, you know, you might do something you like for yourself every day unconsciously, just as part of your habits. But what if every day you took anything from five minutes to two hours and you had a list of things that you like to give yourself? One might be listening to your favorite song for five minutes. One might be going for a one hour massage so that you can always pick something that fits your time, your budget, um, and, and your availability that day, but that every single day you take one thing from that long list and you give it to yourself as a conscious act of self-love. Hilariously, it's way harder than you think. <laughs> um, cause <laughs> the thing that really got me was they said, if you miss a day, that's okay, but then you have to go back to the beginning. And I remember at the time being a little triggered by that. I was like, what do you mean? You have to go all the way back to the beginning. And then I was laughing at myself because I was thinking, God, it's really, it's just like do something nice for yourself for 21 days. What's the problem here? It's not like, you know, run 20 miles every day. But in a way for your, for calibrating your own self-love, it is a bit like running a marathon every day because the consistency of that pattern, like anything, will forever change the way you treat yourself. So I kept a gratitude journal for about eight months in a row. And I don't keep one daily now, but gratitude is really present in my life because of that eight month period. I started noticing how grateful I was all the time in a way that I didn't before I did it as a daily practice. So I highly recommend if you're listening to this and you're not going to get the book, um, just try what I suggest about the three week self love challenge, because it is surprising how we are more willing to find love or connection with others um, than we are ourselves, those of us who are a bit more on the extrovert scale than the introvert scale. But equally, I think for introverts who are like, well, no, I, I like being alone, you will still be surprised how when you actively do this for yourself every single day for three weeks, it's going to move something in you. And um, it, it's like any practice or focus, you will start to move some energy of, I don't deserve this, this is selfish, this is self-centered. It's none of those things. It's just you looking after yourself and that will have a knock-on effect on how you look after others and how present you are for your life. Beautiful. Wow. That's amazing. So is there any other, uh, anything else that you'd like to share maybe from the book or just um, anything that's coming to you now that you'd like to share? It, well, you know, what I will say about the book is it's um, 15 chapters long. It has a great forward by Regina Meredith, who if you haven't seen her, her show Open Minds on Gaia or her own website, she's a fantastic um, journalist and somebody who has been uh, broadcasting consciousness material for decades. And 
she's really good at understanding channeling and its place in the world. So I asked her to write us forward. I share my personal story in the introduction and how I got into channeling. And then there are all these chapters on everything from abundance, loving money through to sex and sexual energy, um, cultivating great relationships. It kind of spans the whole spectrum, including the, the opening chapter is you are a light worker. So I wanted to give a kind of really broad base in the book. So, um, so yeah, the, the book is kind of a map, if you like, for awakening and some of the energies that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. But my biggest intent with the book, excuse me, my biggest intent with the book was that people would um, have a calibration around their own intuition, that they would experience the book and they would get an imprint of channeled energy, intuitive energy, just by absorbing the pages. So that, that was kind of my hope and intention in putting this book into the world. Well, fantastic. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you, Lee. And um, again, people can find you at leeharrisenergy.com, as well as I will have all your links below uh, at uh, Millionaire Medium on the blog. And um, wow, just fat. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> yeah, same, same. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And um, yeah, at my website, we have um, a, a free abundance, a couple of free abundance gifts right there at the top of the homepage. So if anybody wants to check those out, they're there. And um, thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Death podcast. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any financial or legal decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Exploring Death. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.